Hello to all of you this beautiful morning. We are here today to solemnly remember the Africans who were brought to these shores by ships in bondage. More importantly, we are here to commemorate those who did not survive this arduous trip we call the Middle Passage. It is altogether fitting that we should do this on a day that we Americans have set aside in memoriam for fallen souls. I'm Chris Leonard, co-chairman of the Yorktown Middle Passage Committee. I bid you greetings and welcome to the Remembrance Ceremony and Wayside Dedication. The National Park Service has created a wayside sign that we will unveil today. It marks the slave trade's port of entry in Yorktown. This will be the first site in the country to install such a marker. It is now my honor and great pleasure to introduce you to Lois Winter, Chairman of the York County Historical Committee and this event's co-chair.
I'm going to give voice to those souls who arrived by means of the topic, souls of no luggage. What is Africa to me? Copper sun or scarlet sea, jungle star or jungle track. Strong bronze men or regal women from wounds law and I sprang when the birds of Eden sang. One these centuries removed from scenes his father loved, what is Africa to me? County Cullen, poet of the Harlem Renaissance. Nearly all groups that arrived in America had luggage for the well-to-do a number of bags that one most cherished possessions. And for others not so fortunate, they had modest bags of their only possessions. And still others who came to the shores of America with no luggage and no tangible possessions. The group that arrived in America with a number of bags filled with their most cherished possessions boarded ships in the harbors of Europe's major port cities, modestly dressed and waving goodbye to family and friends. They prepared to cross the vastness of the Atlantic to arrive in America to start a new adventure of opportunity, religious tolerance, economic security, social and political equality. The group arriving in America with luggage containing their only possessions also departed Europe's major port cities. They were the drags of Europe's unwanted population. It was their poor, destitute, dispossessed, and incarcerated. They also prepared for an adventure, not as noble as the first, but still one of the greatest possibilities. The group that arrived without luggage had an invisible possession. It was their only possession. The Africans' passage from the interior to the coastal ports, the beginning of the Ma'afa, a track of death, was characterized by couples connecting the kidnapped or the prisoners of war by long poles of a Y connecting at the end. The necks of the victims were connected at each Y. For those who were sick or wounded, their trek ended in agony and death. Those victims that survived the initial stage of the Ma'afa, the corral of the outposts of the European trader, was their destination. There they would be held until enough had been gathered or the ship was available. Sometimes this was weeks before departure. The lack of food, water, sleeping area, and sanitation would reduce their number. The wails and the cries still haunt the castles along the African coast to be heard today by visitors who seek connection to their ancestors. These fellow travelers did not depart the teeming port cities of Europe. They were very humbly dressed. They did not wave goodbye to family and friends. They departed in the early morning hours, passing through the door of no return. The portal which yesterday's are lost, the present becomes drama, and tomorrow's gets the loss in the shuffles of a nation's history. They departed in small canoes or rowboats. They could not see the vessel of their voyage until it appeared in the haze of the dawn. They were transported in the early morning hours to lessen the possibility of revolt or any escape in unfamiliar darkness. As they boarded the ship, the captain of the vessel may not have seen that all the passengers had no luggage, but they did have the same possession. Then they were placed in shackles and chains, separated by sex and age. Their bodies were contorted into spoon configurations to maximize the capacity of the vessel. They pleaded and wailed for mercy and compassion. Then the lids of the ship holes were sealed. No light of measure, only the cries of their fellow passengers, the eerie sound of the ocean washing the sides of the floating coffin. As the ship moved from sight to sight along the coast for weeks to come, filling its hold with men, women, and children of different nations, states, kingdoms, cultures, and skills for their journey across the Atlantic. There was the strangeness of unknown dialects, the presence of unfamiliar faces. Their trek was not one of opportunity or the possibility of a better life, nor to find sanctuary or religious tolerance. 
Who are these souls of no luggage? There are Ibo, Ibibido, Wolof, Yoruba, Mandingo, and many more. These souls represent a complex pan-African identity. These Africans were captives of war, victims of raids for the interior, kidnapping by fellow Africans to be sold to Europeans of assorted stripes and nations who plunder Africa for its greatest wealth, black gold, its humanity. This was the travail of the Atlantic, the Middle Passage, the epic of monumental proportion, our Holocaust of millions of souls, the children of the sun and mother Africa, whose bones littered the floor of the Atlantic, plowed the Atlantic to their unknown fate. Their lives were ended by disease, flux, melancholia, suicide, lash, murder, and the end of an anchor into the blessings of a watery grave. Standing to America, bring home black gold, black ivory, black seed. Deep in the festering hole, their father lies. Of his bones, New England pews were made, these altar lights that were his eyes. Deep in the festering hole, their father lies. The corpse of mercy rots with him. Rats eat the loving, rotten, glitten eyes. But oh, the living look at you. The human eyes with suffering accuse you whose hatred reaches to the swell of the dark to strike like a leper's claw. You cannot stare the hatred down or chain the fear that stalks the watches and breathe on you the fetid scorches breath. Cannot kill the deep immortal human wish of timeless will. Excerpts from the Middle Park Passage by Robert Hayden, poet. The voyage nigh in, the slave ship known as the Berkeley Galley, captained by Francis Pitt, of the home port of Bristol, England, enters the Chesapeake, now known as the York, to dock at Yorktown. The first of three voyages of Berkeley Galley, of more than 480 African souls, transported from the region of Calabar in the Bight of Biafra of present-day Nigeria. The cargo is filled with the wretches of the journey who are brought to the deck to be lotioned in coconut oil to hide the imperfections of their lot. Their black skins glazed with the richness of their mother's touch were herded naked to the dock and paraded up the Great Valley path to the auction at the Yorktown Cordard steps. Cowed by the handlers to the auction block, their fears and voices of distant ancestors accompanied them to the top, whereupon they were presented for inspection and sale. As a gavel fell, their world of a new day has begun. There is no luggage to unpack, to place in the chest for future use. There's only possession is tucked away for another day. Their numbers are spread west to Richmond and the Piedmont, to the new lines of tobacco, new plantations, new masters, new varieties of tongues, an unknown speech to learn, new rules of conduct, new faces called Masa, Mistress and Little Massa, the new name, what is its meaning? What is the possession of the souls of no luggage? It is the legacy of memory, the creative dynamic of our humanity, the treasure of self that is characterized by agency, tenacity, and resistance. Those Africans who boarded the slave ships from the corral of the coast of West Africa, from Gambia to Angola, came with the skills of farmers, harvesters of grain, rice, and indigo. Their worlds were influenced by the dynamic of the kingdoms of Ghana, Mali, and Sungai. The tale of Mansa Musa's Hajj to Mecca still reverberates as the legend of the ages. The science of medicine, the scholarship of the Islamic African world, flowered at Timbuktu and Jenei. Some of the souls of no luggage came to the new world as animists, Christians, Muslims, skilled in Arabic, Portuguese, Spanish, French, and English. Other Africans came to Yorktown and ports along the James and York rivers from the Caribbean and the West Indies after undergoing the process of seasoning to form the confluence of the African diaspora. Stanley Crotch, a present-day intellectual and social critic, 
perhaps sums up the journey of the New World African of the Middle Passage in the American experience from slavery, the hopes of reconstruction, the Nadea of the age of Jim Crow, the aspirations of the modern civil rights movement struggle to paraphrase, quote, the greatest gift and achievement of African Americans to mankind has been its struggle to reclaim its humanity and its sense of identity. Thus, our presence today to commemorate the 31,000 of our ancestors of the Middle Passage that arrived here in Yorktown, giving voice to that continuum of the reclamation of our humanity. The 31,000 of the 472,000 of the 10,650,000 who survived the Middle Passage to America between 1698 and 1771. In the Caribbean, Barbados received 435,000. Jamaica, 1,020,000. Brazil received the lion's share of 4,810,000. As well, we give recognition and memorial to the two million Africans who perished in the Middle Passage and other millions who died as victims of the Ma'afa before the arrival at the corrals. Quote, we stand tall because we stand on the shoulders of many ancestors, an African proverb. My name is Ohad Joseph Jenkins. My wife, Louise, will interpret. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. God is the greatest. God is the greatest. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah I bear witness that nothing deserves to be worshiped except God Ashhadu an Muhammadan Rasulullah Ashhadu an Muhammadin Rasulullah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the apostle of God. Hayya al salah. Hayya al salah. Come to prayer. Come to prayer. Hayal al Fula Hayal al Fula Come to success, come to success. Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar. God is the greatest, God is the greatest. La ilaha illallah. Nothing deserves to be worshipped except God. My name is Rob Whitehead and I serve as pastor of Louisiana Baptist Church in Williamsburg. Let us pray. Uh, gracious and righteous God, you are forgiving and you are loving. As we gather upon these shores, we pray that you will make yourself known, make your presence known by your spirit. It is in your name we pray. Good morning. I bring you greetings from Shiloh Baptist Church, Yorktown, Virginia. Most eternal and all wise God, we thank you for this day of life and strength. Thank you for your new mercies that you bestow upon us every day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day of commemoration, not only for the fallen soldiers of this great country on this Memorial Day, but for the lives and memories and legacies of the millions of African slaves who were transported across these waters to America. Father, we thank you for their significant place in history for America, Virginia, as well as Yorktown. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness from generation to generation. 
Thank you, God, for millions of people who were counted as worthless. It was through their loins, through their seed, that great people came to prominence in this great country. We ask you, Father God, on this day of commemoration that you would empower us to preserve their memory as we commemorate. Let us also be mindful of their sacrifices and whom of those in whom we honor. We ask you, God, to bless the vision of this community, this committee who have done great research to make this day possible. Bless the families of those who are affected. Bless us all as we stand here and honor you on today. We pray this prayer in the matchless, marvelous name of Jesus, the name above all names. It is in Christ's name that we pray this prayer. Amen. I'm Carlton Bacham, a priest in the Episcopal Church who sprang from the Anglican Church. <clears throat> we were on the wrong side of many issues. Um, the revolution itself, because of our deep ties to England, and often of slavery, until luminaries like William Wilberforce and John Newton rose up and took a stand. So I am here in their spirit, as are the many members of my congregation sprinkled among us. We begin our prayers with a simple formula. Most of you know it. I say, the Lord be with you, and you say, and also with you. you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, we gather as inheritors of great ancestral grief all around. If it be necessary, let us drink it to the dregs. Let us empty that chalice so that it might be filled with new wine, your new spirit, reminding us again and again that our wholeness in you is greater than our brokenness. Our wholeness is greater than our brokenness. Our wholeness is greater than our brokenness. Let us know that no act of reconciliation is too small. No gesture of healing is too small. Accept the small offering we bring this morning and draw it to completion in the largeness of your spirit. We pray in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And let the people say Amen. 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 My name is Father Queen Welbeck, a native of Ghana, West Africa. I came to this country 52 years ago as a student in North Carolina, Massachusetts, Michigan, Maryland, Washington, D.C. That's where I met my wife, a native of Newport News. We've been together for 40 years now. We had the opportunity to move around this country, moved to Hawaii for a few years, traveled around the Pacific, came all around back to Washington, D.C., and then to Virginia where I had a position at William & Mary from where I retired 12 years ago. I'm very honored to stand before you on this great day. We could not have ordered a better day. Just look at this. The drama, please, can you join me? Sure. Distinguished guests, chiefs, the original custodians of this land. You know the story. We are here today to honor the ancestors. And for those of you who have had the opportunity to travel around Africa, especially West Africa, Ghana, my country alone, has 29 castles, 29 more than any other African. The ancestors 
paid a measurable price. If you are familiar with African villages, they are usually small, 20, 30, 40 people. And if you can just imagine, a young man called Kofi, because he was born on Friday, and a young woman called Ekua, because he was born on Wednesday. They went to their farm to tend their farm crops and never made it at home. As a historian that said before me, they never had a chance to say goodbye. The epic story has not ended. And if you could imagine the terror, the fear of people pouncing on you while you were working on your farm or walking to the river to fetch water, total strangers tying you up, binding you up, and carrying you through dense forests and eventually into one of these castles. You had no idea what this was all about. The ancestors for whom we have gathered here paid a big, big price. What I'm going to do in pouring this libation, I will start with my own native language called Tri, among the Akan people of Ghana. And I'm half Akan, half Ghan from the capital. So what I'm going to say to start is this. When I say I go, all of you will say together, Amen. I go. Amen. I go. Amen. These are modern times, so. <laughs> Pardon me if you see this bottle. <laughs> What's in here is palm wine. Palm wine comes from the palm tree. Typically, you cut down the tree and you shake it toward the end. You cut a hole in it. And every morning, you have some branches, you light them with the flame. And you keep on, can you hear me? Okay. And you have to use this flame. You touch this palm tree every morning for about 10, 15 minutes. And then you make a hole in the tree itself. You put a straw in there and you put it under the tree. And lo and behold, drip, drip, drip. And you get this palm wine. The palm wine initially is sweet like soda, but in time it gets harder and harder and becomes the best champagne you have ever tasted. <laughs> so to honor the ancestors, I'm going to pretend as here is the original palm wine. Great Creator, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and all therein. We have assembled here this morning in honor of 
thy children. We were forced on an epic journey whose end we still have not seen yet. We have gathered here this morning to remember the terrible, terrible journey that you were forced to take. Great ancestors, forgive us for what we did to you. Those of us collaborators who captured our own brothers and sisters and sold them away. Forgive us. Forgive us. Please accept this drink. history of this land better than I do. The blood, tears, and sweat of the millions who were brought here and forced to work from dawn to dusk without pay. Please, I said, this is it. Imagine what would have happened if these ancestors had been paid a fair wage. Their descendants today will be what? Billionaires? Millionaires and all the family. You work for nothing. And today, your descendants are spread all over the world. CEOs, Greek layers, teachers, nurses, medical doctors. Dentists, every discipline against all odds. Your descendants have achieved. We pour this drink in your event. battle has not ended. The wars that have been fought on this land and abroad, the sacrifices your ancestors have made and continue to make. For those friends and people of goodwill who fought side by side, I came in time, in time to see the civil rights battles in the 60s in the south and around the country. Indeed, this is a country the land that has been soaked with blood, tears, and pain. Great Creator, we have blessed this land and we pray that you will continue to bless this land. We pray that the ancestors, wherever they are, may rest in peace and remember that they did not fight in vain. So for all those and the ones yet unborn, we pour this drink in your heart.
Ana. <laughs> so as we depart from here, may the spirits of all those who went before us always dwell with us and bless us and follow us in all we do. And when I say trap Omanyaba, all of you will say trap. Okay? Trap Omanyaba. Trap Omanyaba. Trap Omanyaba. And I the drum will talk for one minute. Thank you. Ceremonies in Fort Marcus Project, and I'm pleased to see this ceremony in memory of our ancestors. Uh, what Miss Edith heard, uh, please come up. This portion of the ceremony is the personal one. It's the one in which uh, each of us, if we choose, will do our own personal libation. But before we do that, in order to ensure, number one, that all ethnic groups from the continent are represented, our young people will read the names of the 55 African nations so that we are inclusive. And then uh, they will place a flower, a carnation, in the water in honor of each one of the nations. But even before that, we have Miss Edith Heard, whose family descended from the Africans who arrived here at Yorktown. And as an elder in the community, she will face the four compass directions to make sure again that we are including all of our ancestors. Ms. Heard. To the north, to the east, to the south, and to the west. This is inclusive. This is all of us. That is our universal libation. This ceremony is about remembering and honoring This is what we do. It is also a healing because it's something that we haven't done. We are connecting with our ancestors. We are repairing. When people talk about reparations, it has to be the repairing of our souls, of our hearts. This is a connecting with our ancestors. In the tradition of the Africans, and many cultures, the dead are not dead and removed. And we're repairing the circle. So if the young people will begin, you come up with your cards and read the name. Tanzania, Togo, Tunisia. Cote d'Ivoire, Djibouti, and Egypt.
Burkina Faso, Burundi, Cameroon. Somalia, South America, Africa, South Sudan. Nigeria, 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 Rwanda, Rwanda. Senegal, Seychelles, Sierra Leone. Malawi. Mali and Merge Nail. Sudan, Swaziland, Seo Teme, and Principe. Morocco, Mozambique, and Nabia. Liberia, Libya, and Madagascar. Equatorial Guinea, Eritrea, and Gabon. Central African Republic, Chad. Uganda, Western Sahara, Zambia, Zimbabwe. Algeria, Angola, Seo, Tomai, and Prince of Pay, Botswana. Kamaros, Bazavio, and Kinshasa. Guinea Bissau, Kenya, Lesotho. We ask that the young people now take these flowers and place them in the water where the ancestors can. Finding words after all that's been said is difficult, so I'll keep it short. First, let me ask all those, although your names are on the program, all those who served on this committee to honor the Middle Passage, please stand so you can be recognized by all those that are here today. This truly was a coming together of this community here in Yorktown, and I'm so proud of, uh, of that committee and what they're brought about today. Also, the importance of this beyond your town and in your town is expressed by our elected officials being here this morning. Obviously, they have schedules on this traditional Memorial Day that will carry them to cemeteries or, or to York Hall or whatever later today, but to start the day here. And we have all of the supervisors here except for Chairman Zaruba, who was on vacation, is not in town. But we have Sheila Knoll here. We have George Hirsch. Uh, I don't see Tom Shepard, and we have Don Wiggins, the vice chair here. We also have, representing the Commonwealth of Virginia, Senator Tommy Norman, the majority leader of the Senate of Virginia. And we also have our Congressman Rob Whitman, who's here with us today, Congressman of the 1st District of Virginia. We would, yeah. we would not be here today 
if a mild-mannered lady named Ann Chin had not made a phone call to uh, David Meredith and myself a little over a year ago and came in to meet with two 60-something-ish white men who I am sort of ashamed, but now I don't have to be because I now know a lot about the Middle Passage. I did not know at all about the Middle Passage. And when she left my office that day, there was no doubt that this ceremony, if not here, where would it be? And if not now, when would it be? And we're here and now for this ceremony. I dropped the sheet of paper I need. Since, <laughs> since I said that I didn't have words, I'm going to use someone else's. I'm going to use Nobel laureate Toni Morrison's words in 1989 when she was be interviewed about her book, Beloved, where she stated this. There is no place you or I can go to think about or not think about, to summon the presences of or recollect the absences of slaves. There is no suitable memorial or plaque or wreath or wall or park or skyscraper lobby. There's no 300 foot tower. There's no small bench by the road. There is not even a tree scored, an initial that I can visit or you can visit in Charleston, or Savannah, or New York, or Providence, or better still, on the banks of the Mississippi. And she said, and because such a place doesn't exist, she wrote the book Beloved. Well, I can say to you all today that we unveiled this marker in just a minute. I can tell Toni Morrison she now has a place where she can come and have all of those feelings. And I'm very proud that the first marker in the United States is going to be here in Yorktown, and that's going to be at Colonial National Historical Park, where we are to tell the story of the American people. I'm going to now ask Lois and Chris to join me at the wayside. I'm going to ask Congressman Whitman to join us to represent the nation, Senator Norma to represent the Commonwealth of Virginia, Don Wiggins to represent the County of York as we dedicate this memorial, this uh, wayside. Please join us. Lois and Ann, please. Loosen the slip knots. Don, a remembrance on behalf of County of York. Thank you, Dan. You know, um, I remember so much about York County having practically grown up around here most of my life. I have, still have a scar on my uh, knee where when I was about that big, um, I cut it on an oyster shell out there. Of course, I thought it was the Atlantic Ocean. My father was kind of uh, tight with stuff like that, and this was the Atlantic Ocean that he was taking us to. Then I remember... Um, when the road washed out here many times. Then we formed, uh, I was fortunate enough to be a part of a committee that was formed by the Board of Supervisors many years ago to determine what Yorktown was going to become, what was going to be down here. At the time, we only had Nick's Restaurant, or was a little grocery store, and that had closed up. <clears throat> so we got together, and what you see now here in Yorktown is the benefit from, from that committee's assignment. And um, then I was fortunate enough after that to serve on the Board of Supervisors in York County. And um, 
we were even able to pick out the color brick that was going to be on the sidewalks. And Ms. Noel and I went to Florida to check out the, uh, the floating uh, docks that we eventually uh, were able to get. <clears throat> Yorktown has had many, many, many ceremonies. And they've all been good. They, we've all, boy, we really have, we really have praised our people that won the independence here. Uh, nothing ever was bad that happened in Yorktown throughout the years. Uh, we, we only had something good to praise Yorktown about. <clears throat> but I don't think I've ever seen a celebration where we've been able to put the past, the, the dark side of the past, to Yorktown like we have today. And the dark side of the path we've kept covered up all these years. We don't want to talk about slavery. We don't want to talk about that stuff. I didn't even know we had slave ships that came into Yorktown until uh, the article in the newspaper. And uh, because we didn't talk about things like that. But today we've seen the bright sunshine of the good Lord come and open up all that darkness that we have been hiding. And we got it right here. And once we learn to deal with it, then we can have solace in knowing that uh, it's over with. So thank you very much. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Senator Norman, on behalf of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you, Dan. Good morning. Good morning. Over the years, I have had the privilege of being the chairman of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, and I also serve on the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. And I use that as a point of reference because I have had an, an intense interest in the history of the historic triangle ever since I was a child. And frequently you hear about the heritage of the historic triangle in the sense of this is where America was founded in Jamestown to where American independence was won here in Yorktown. But there's a lot of other history that goes on in the historic triangle and today certainly represents the epitome of another chapter in that great history of the historic triangle. Both uh, my good friend uh, Chief Adams and Mrs. Chin mentioned the word healing, which I actually wrote down on the, the program. When you get to be my age, if you don't make notes, you forget things. And I cannot help but reflect that the healing process has been a remarkable thing, not just in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but in this country. If you think back to 19, excuse me, 1770, when this nation was starting to strive for its independence, one of the casualties at the Boston Massacre was a gentleman by the name of Crispus Atticus, for which there is a housing development that bears his name in Williamsburg. You think about the thunderous voice of Frederick Douglass, Douglass, who championed and was an early outspoken and persistent critic of slavery. You think about the remarkable transition when in 1989 the first African American was elected governor in the United States, which was right here in Virginia with the Honorable L. Douglas Wilder, who I stood with when we dedicated the historical plaque in Jamestown. And actually the culmination, who would have thought when these Africans who were forcefully taken from their native land over 300 years ago, that one of their descendants would be elected the President of the United States. The healing process never start, stops, but it is certainly another chapter that is written today, and it is something that the Commonwealth of Virginia should take great pride in contributing to that healing. Thank you, sir. Congressman Rob Whitman. Thank you, Dan, and good morning. It truly is an honor and privilege to be here with you today. Folks, isn't this a fantastic day? Absolutely unbelievable, I'll tell you. It really is a, it's a great symbol of who we are as a nation. If you look at what's happened today, we have the Yorktown Middle Passage Committee, folks that came together and said, listen, we need to take the time to acknowledge our history and to make sure that more people learn about that. We also have the Middle Passage and Port Marker project that says let's make sure that we take that next step and that we 
educate folks about this history and that we acknowledge it. That's an important part of this. An important part of this too is what happens at the state level by making sure that as people travel to this area, they understand what happened. And the same thing at the, at the national level. I would say that today is a day of national significance. This being the first marker, first of all, acknowledging the history of the Great Passage, but also remembering the impact that it had on people's lives. That significant impact, that is part of the history of this world, the history of this nation, something that we must learn from. We must make sure others understand so they, they know uh, some of the less uh, attractive parts of our history. That's, that's critical for us to learn about that. So the education element of today is important. It's also taken the time uh, to, to, to understand that part of our history. And then last and most importantly, is to begin the healing process. And the only way that healing process begins is to make sure that we, we understand our history, we acknowledge it, we make sure that other people learn of that history so they know the pain and suffering that occurred with Africans that came across the Atlantic, not only here in the United States, but elsewhere, to understand the magnitude of that history and the impact that it had, and to make sure, too, that we pass that on, not just to this generation, but to generations to come, to make sure that they understand that part of our history. It's critical that that understanding take place so the healing can take place. And today is the first step along that journey where I know this marker, along with many others throughout the United States, will be placed to make sure that people understand the magnitude of the impact that this had on people's lives, the pain and suffering, and to make sure that we today begin that healing process in discussing that part of our history. So folks, thank you so much again. Thank you to all of you that came out today from across the community, from across the state, and from across our nation to make today, I think, a day of national significance on this Memorial Day. How, how, how absolutely apropos it is to be here on Memorial Day uh, to memorialize those uh, that came across through the Middle Passage, that pain and suffering, and the, the influence that it has on us today and the beginning of that healing process. Thank you all so much, folks, and may God bless you. Thank you. Lois, would you like to say one more word? Or are you, you're fine. <laughs> well, I can't stop crying, so I don't know if I can speak. Well, I just want to thank again all the people who have come and the fact that this is, community has come together for this one project. And I hope this is a beginning, not an ending, for the continuing dialogue we're going to be having. I especially want to thank Dan Smith, because none of this would have happened without this enormous support of the National Park. Thank you, Lois. And Dave Meredith needs to be mentioned in that same breath, my, my partner in uh, all of these undertakings. And a brief word, now that you've actually seen your wayside that you are responsible for as the Executive Director of the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Markers Project Incorporated. Thank you. Everyone knows that I do not like to speak publicly, but this is such an honor. Um, it is um, the beginning of the realization of a promise that I've kept that in every community where Africans arrived initially, where American history and American history began, that we would mark it. And everyone will know it. This is not a British, this is not a French, this is not a Spanish, Portuguese development. This is a European, African, and Native American settlement and development. That's what this nation is. We need to begin to recognize it. I thank Chief Adams and the members of the community for clearing the land so that we can hold this. And as I said, there are 40 ports, 40 Middle Passage ports from New Hampshire to Texas, where Africans first arrived, and it's an honor to be part of your town's uh, marking of this history. Thank you so much for coming and supporting. Thank you. Thank you. We will now have the benediction by the Reverend Carter. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fred Carter. 
I'm the pastor of the Shepherdsville Baptist Church, which is over there in Gloucester, behind those trees. It is a church which was established and founded by free people of color. They have a great tradition of freedom at my church. This uh, beach became the port of entry in 1691, but I would remind you that from 1640 until 1671, the majority of the enslaved people who came here were from Cornwall, Scotland, and Ireland. They suffered as well. Their names aren't recorded, and the ships that they came on aren't recorded, except for one, which the Irish historians say was the Mayflower, the same ship that brought the pilgrims. Isn't that amazing? So we're about to leave this beautiful beach, which has been watered with countless tears. May we learn of the value of freedom for those who had none. May we learn of determination from those who suffered great loss and survived. May we remember the thousands of Irish, Scot, and English slaves as well who suffered along us, along with us in unrequited toil. May we learn of the courage of those who fought and died here at Yorktown in two great wars of national liberation. May we appreciate the men and women, especially the thousands of children who suffered under the lash and chains of chattel slavery as they built the historic buildings that grace this historic hill. May we remember their descendants who fled here to the Union Army and freedom and safety from those who had enslaved them. May we remember the thousands who joined the United States colored troops and fought and bled and died to free their wives and families from humiliating bondage and injustice. Let us recall the words of the one who suffered the world's greatest injustice. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And let our national benediction be this. May you have the hindsight to know where you've been, the foresight to know where you're going, and the insight to know when you've gone too far. God bless all who have joined us in this memorial celebration and guide, protect, console, and direct the United States of America and bless the President of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama. Amen. 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 We have come over a way that with tears have been watered. We have come treading a path through the blood of the slaughtered. And so as I leave here, and I invite you, if you have a bottle which has some water in it, to do as I'm going to do. My personal libation will be to sprinkle my way to the top of that hill. And as you walk behind me, you will be treading the tears and the shed blood of brave Americans. God bless you all.